And now it's my pleasure to th turn things over to Larissa Litsky. She's in her first year as Dean of the University of Missouri School of Law, having come to us from the University of Florida. Dean Litsky is a renowned First Amendment scholar who's published essential case books and many articles about press freedom, defamation, and legal issues in social media. You can read more about her accomplishments in your printed program, which I hope you picked up uh, on, on your way into the room. So now please welcome Dean Litsky and her panel. So thank you all so much for coming this morning. There has never been a better time to be discussing media ethics, media law, and the role of the press in our democracy. And I would submit to you that there are no better people to discuss that with than the people we have assembled here on, on the dais. So I am going to introduce them briefly. Their extended bios are in your program, and I encourage you to look at those. But I don't want to take away from our time to have a truly interactive discussion about these important issues. So to my far right, at least geographically, is... <laughs> Only that. Is <laughs> Ron L. Anderson Jones. She is from the S.J. Quinney School of Law at the University of Utah. And she formerly clerked for U.S. Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Uh, next to her is famed media lawyer extraordinaire Chuck Tobin with Ballard Spar. Uh, next to him is Mary Rose Papandrea at the University of North Carolina School of Law, and she clerked for U.S. Supreme Court Justice David Souter. On my left is Amy Guida from Tulane University and has had a long prior career as a broadcast and print, an award-winning broadcast and print journalist. Uh, next to her is Kurt Wimmer at Covington and Burling, also a famed media and First Amendment and cybersecurity attorney. And next to him is Sonia West from the University of Georgia School of Law, and she clerked for US Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens who's been in the news a bit this past week. <laughs> so let's kick it off, because I, I, we don't have much time, and this is going to be a great conversation. Let's kick it off with Ron L. And Ron L., a 2017 Pew Research poll uh, revealed that the public is increasingly skeptical of the notion that the news media play an important role in our democracy. And even more surprising in that poll, was that 89% of Democrats believe that the press are an important watchdog on government affairs, but only 42% of Republicans do. So I'm going to kick it off with you and ask what explains this discrepancy, and what, if anything, can the news media do to rebuild public trust, and can the law play a role in that? Yeah, uh, so, so I think this is... Um one of, if not the most important uh, political question of our time. Um, I think it's no exaggeration to suggest that press freedom ought to be thought of um, on par with other civil liberties that we're thinking about as a community and that we are um, defending as a people. And I think a huge piece of what's happening here uh, is that our political world and therefore our media world have become largely defined on the basis of enemy status, um, insider, outsider status, in ways that are really dangerous. Um, there was a, a really interesting uh, piece in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago summarizing political science scholarship on this question about how um, quite clear it has become that in the last decade or so, American politics have come to be defined not on the basis of who I'm with, but on the basis of who I'm against. And if that, um, if that enemy nature of our political scheme is really driving everything, it has incredible consequences for us as a people and for our democracy and particularly for the role of the press. What it means is that um, if you uh, vote on the basis of um, uh, voting against the person you hate, uh, voting against the party you loathe, there's very little political accountability on the other end once your chosen candidate is elected because you didn't really vote 
um, on the basis of hoping for something from that person, but rather on the basis of sharing a, a loathing with that person. And we've seen, I think, um, the Trump campaign was incredibly successful as uh, at characterizing one of the enemies as the press. And I think that that has large scale ramifications because it's one thing to suggest that the political opponent is the enemy, but to suggest that a democratic institution is the enemy. And it's not just this democratic institution. I think this democratic institution is housed with uh, others, the intelligence community and um, immigrants and um, uh, um, people across the southern border and uh, people of certain um, religions. And those, um, those consequences of enemy construction of the press can be pretty significant. I think um, we have seen in the past, um, in the political arc of history, that when we characterize institutions as the enemy and are successful in convincing enough of the people that they are outsiders rather than helpful insiders, the, the very um, swift next step is the removal of individual liberty. So I think lots of people on the panel are gonna have ideas about the role of the law in pushing back against this. I think one major um, role that the law can have is that the, role, the, the law works in tandem with larger social norms, right? We send signals about what's valuable. We send signals about uh, uh, what rights we defend, about what institutions uh, continue to be um, central to our democracy. And I think that, um, I, I think the judiciary may end up playing a really significant role in the years to come in terms of um, describing, uh, it, once this sort of tough talk about the press as enemies makes its way into actual challenges uh, uh, about press freedom, I think we're going to have to um, really rely on the courts to push back against that notion and describe them as they have described them in the past as really important um, democratic institutions. So, so Chuck, you've spent your career defending the press um, so I have a question. What made the press vulnerable to these kinds of attacks as an enemy? What, what was the weakness that made them vulnerable uh, to those attacks? And what can be done about it? And are you as worried as Ronell about that ultimately permeating into actual legal principles? Um, well, thank you for the uh, question. You know, I, I think that um, what we've seen is, is a bit of a lawyering up of the process of disseminating the news from uh, Capitol Hill and from the White House, and then on the other side, um, a, a bit of a, a lawyering up on the part of uh, the various press outlets in dealing with the issue. And you know, there's an interesting parallel between the process of news reporting uh, and the dissemination of information and what we do in the court system. The court system is, is based on an adversarial process. So you have two sets of lawyers on opposite sides. They are duty bound to zealously represent their clients they present what we might call alternative facts from each other to courts. Um, and in that clash of ideas, the very nature of the adversarial system is to present a clash of different opinions, different perspectives, different sets of facts in the most favorable way to your client and let a decision maker, a fact finder, a judge, a jury sort those things out. That's not in theory much unlike the marketplace of ideas which underpins modern journalism and which has been written about in, in the law from everyone from Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes to Chief Justice Roberts. Marketplace of ideas, people come out with different ideas, you have that clash of ideas, and out of that people can make their own decisions, you can find your own facts um, as news consumers in an audience, and you can make your own decisions on where to vote, where to send your children to school, um, and on and on and on. The major difference for years um, ha has come out that uh, has been that and remains in a certain, to a certain extent. We lawyers are bound by uh, a couple of rules. We're a regulated profession. So we're bound by the rules of ethics. We cannot lie. We cannot present knowing lies to courts and to fact finders. And we're bound by the rules of civility. If you get out of line, if you get out of your lane in advocating to a court, you will be punished. We, we are, we are um, under oath and by regulation required to be civilized in our presentation. I think what we've seen, and I think Ronell, you know, hit it right on the head, is we've, we've seen kind of a, a more lawyer-like approach from the news disseminators, from the White Houses. And I would argue it didn't start with President Trump. It's been increasing for years, 
President Nixon and, and Vice President Agnew were, were fiercely advocating a certain point of view about the war and about the nattering nabobs in the press and became very adversarial. And I think we even saw that through you know, the, the, the second Bush administration, to a certain extent the Obama administration, and the Trump administration taking a page from President Trump's own litigious nature has taken that to a new level. And the problem is they're not bound by the same rules of civility. They're not bound by the truth, the, the ethical rules um, that, that we lawyers are bound by. And so you have the same skill set, the same style being brought to the public debate, but you don't have um, the same rules applying. What can the, the press do? Double down on their efforts, which we've seen, and I'm sure we'll talk about quite a bit, reinvest in the news product um, and, and uh, get, get people focused on uh, investigative journalism, on niche journalism and, and new ideas and new ways to bring news to people um, and continue to, to just stand firm and push back against this whole wave of untruth that we're seeing and, and don't, uh, don't relinquish. Um, uh, continue to come to that marketplace of ideas with a very tough commitment and I would argue maintain your civility, maintain a civilized commitment to, to the marketplace of ideas. So Mary Rose, in your scholarship, you focused quite a bit on the role of social media. And so my question for you is, is do social media undermine the notion of the marketplace of ideas? I mean, one, one of the ideals is that the more information, the better, and the, the truth will ultimately emerge from a multitude of voices in that marketplace. But have social media increased polarization, and are they you know, uh, undermining the ideal of the marketplace of ideas. Sure. I mean, there are a lot of wonderful, beautiful things about social media. I just want to start with the positive. So, you know, it brings people together. I can stay in touch with all my fellow panelists and hear about babies and what, see pictures of kittens and so on. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, that, so that's the good part. But the, but the bad part is that people are polarizing. So this is not... I don't think a news flash for anyone in this room, but people are uh, more likely to be friends and, and read and follow people they already agree with. And so people are um, siloing themselves. They're not listening to the other side. They're not engaging in uh, that same kind of uh, marketplace of ideas where they're confronting um, uh, people with views that were different from theirs. So if they don't like what someone's saying on social media, say on their Facebook feed, they may unfriend them uh, and decide, we, we're talking <laughs> about an incident. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, no, Ron L is a victim. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, there, there's been uh, social science research to show this, uh, that, that in addition, people have heuristical biases, so they, uh, when they do confront things that are um, contrary to their views, they, they discount them and don't give them any credence whatsoever, and then when they see things that support their pre-existing views, they give them a lot of credit, so they tend to keep moving farther and farther apart. So social media has played an important role. It's not the only thing, but it's played an important role in the increasing polarization of our society. It's reflecting a lot of what's happening in the political world, but it's really exasperating the problem. And, and one other thing I would mention with social media, there's so many things to say about it, is that a lot of people are getting their news from social media instead of going straight to the, uh, you know, getting their subscription, uh, you know, on their doorstep in the morning or watching the 6 p.m. broadcast. And, and, uh, and so it's a lot of noise. Uh, studies have shown people are more likely to credit the source, uh, the, the friend who posts the news, rather than the underlying uh, creator of the content. And so people don't, aren't really focusing on, on who is saying uh, the, the actual creator um, and to determine the credibility. Um, and so this really undermines the, in, the press institutions as well. So there are a lot of other things, but those are two, my two main points. And should the law get involved in doing something about the... Well, I think that, you know, just to piggyback on something Ronell, or I think what Ronell was uh, suggesting in her comments is that there are things that the law can do, but I think in this area, the law has a, a more limited role. Uh, I think it's really up to the providers, uh, the platforms, to come up with, with, with weight tools that may perhaps force people to see things they don't like or fact check. Um, you know, I know there are a lot of initiatives underway. I'm not sure any of them are particularly successful yet, um, but, but we can work on that. And then the other role would be education. 
and uh, you know the future lies in our children. So uh, you know, educate them on how to be uh, literate when they're and, and how to tell what's true and what's not true. Um, and that is a that's a long term process. But we need to double down and make sure that we are doing everything we can to educate people on how to consume information. So one of the themes of this panel that I that I hope you're picking up is there's an intense interaction between legal principles and social norms. And we tend to think of the First Amendment as having a, a scope that's inviolate and set in stone for all time. But even within constitutional principles, how you inter interpret them in individual cases is influenced by things like the credibility of the press and social norms about the press. They, our judges are human beings, and, and these kinds of issues bleed into their, their reasoning and their interpretation of the scope of uh, rules. So uh, Amy is an expert on media ethics. And as I said, she had extensive experience as, as a, a reporter uh, before starting her career as a legal academic. And so Amy, um, are media ethics part of the solution to keeping our First Amendment principles strong? Well, I think one of the, the problems here, and you all have touched on it so far, is how we define the press and how we define who is a journalist. Uh, so when I taught in a journalism school, a lot of my colleagues said, we're all journalists. And the problem with that is today we have the platform for publishing. And so in effect, we all are journalists. Uh, the, the issue, however, is that if we want to protect, for example, individual privacy in some way, there has to be some sort of limit put on what is appropriate information to be published. And so, uh, and so one of the difficulties now is in defining what is newsworthy. That is a way that we, uh, that is a word we use uh, in tort law in the United States. Newsworthy information is protected. Uh, and non-newsworthy information is not, as long as it's privacy invading. Uh, and so that's a clash that courts are dealing with right now. When someone publishes, for example, uh, a sonogram taken of um, two fetuses, uh, is that information beyond the bounds of what is newsworthy? Uh, when someone then uh, publishes um, a medical chart from a hospital, uh, is that information beyond the bounds of what is newsworthy? And in both both of those examples, the courts decided that the answer was yes, uh, and drew a boundary, a newsworthiness boundary, protecting individual privacy over a publication's decision to publish something. And so it's a really interesting time uh, when um, media ethics has started to play a certain role in those questions. Um, one other quick example, uh, there's a court that decided a case a number of years ago now against NBC's To Catch a Predator. Uh, and in that decision, the court literally looked at the Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics and used that ethics code against the journalists. And that's a very dangerous situation because ethically journalists are bound in a sense to cover or, or, or to abide by um, those code provisions, uh, and yet they're very flexible and they're meant to be very flexible because journalism uh, has to be flexible uh, in coverage at times. So I think it is a very interesting time when um, ethics, uh, social media, um, uh, the definition for journalism and the press is all coming together uh, in very important ways. So Kurt, you've represented a number of both uh, traditional media clients and, and what we might think of as, as new media clients. And so are, are media ethics a sword or a shield in litigation in your experience? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think um, the issues that you just mentioned about who is a journalist um, really do predominate in these questions. You know, who is the media? Who should be bound by media ethics? who believes they're not the media, but you know, they're some, somehow superior or different from the media. You know, I think what we see now is we have these platforms that make it look as if everyone is equal, um, which is problematic in many ways. Um, because it, you can create something called the Denver Journal, for example, which actually isn't a newspaper of record in Denver, but some people might believe that it is, and make it look online exactly like the Denver Post, and have an equivalence of the credibility enhancing functions of the press. 
but that doesn't mean that it's actually journalism. And um, as Chuck will remember, we spent uh, many years together working on trying to pass a uh, privilege for uh, journalists to maintain confidential sources in Congress. And um, the diciest part of that was defining in this age who is a journalist and who should be bound by these, by these rules, who can take advantage of privileges and other benefits for the press. And that, I think, is, is, is part of the issue of the day here. Yeah. Uh, you know, if I can just throw in a historical nugget. Yeah. Um, who was the primary sponsor in the House of Representatives in the early 2000s? <laughs> my, my, the, my, the Vice President, and in fact, we passed that bill through the House of Representatives thanks to the Vice President. He was quite a supporter. So times, they are changing. <laughs> so, Sonia, you have written quite a bit about whether we're all journalists now and how the law might treat that issue and why it matters. Uh, so, are we all journalists now? Um, well, you know, trying to look at the bright side, which sometimes I just have to do every morning when I wake up, find some bright side. I think as a teacher, one of the bright sides of the last year or so has been that this has been a great teaching opportunity about the Constitution and how it works. Uh, and uh, one of those lessons is that at least as, a as far as the Constitution is concerned, um, journalists have far fewer protections than I think most people uh, think. Uh, all throughout sort of the 60s, 70s, into the 80s, the court loved to sort of just talk about how great the press was in what we call dicta, the part of the opinion that kind of doesn't matter all that much. And it, when it came to the actual holding of the case, uh, the court would say, the press is just like everybody else. Uh, we can't give them any special rights uh, because then we'd have to give them to everybody and terrible things uh, would happen. And so what we're seeing, of course, just across the board in the Trump administration is you know, the, the, the stress testing of our Constitution, the pushing of, of um, norms, whether it's you know, excluding people from uh, you know, press conferences or telling uh, the, the PR departments of agencies that they can't answer reporters' questions, or even just things like not respecting, you know, not publicly respecting the work of the press and saying publicly that the press it does an important job, even if sort of privately they're doing things that might uh, um, make us angry. And, and, and this week we've got a lot of attention to even going a step beyond that, which is trying to employ powers of the federal government to silence the press for saying or doing things that the president doesn't like, whether it's trying to impose negative tax policies, uh, higher postal rates, whether it's telling the FCC uh, that they should investigate their broadcast licenses or um, having the Department of Justice uh, uh, interfere with a merger you know, that is explicitly tied to the sale of, of, of CNN. Um, and so the answer is, for, as far as the Constitution is concerned, we don't have the law there right now. I have written that I think we should, and there's unique interests of the press. And for a long time, we could get by lumping everyone together. But I think we see that that is changing for a lot of the reasons that uh, were um, just discussed. Uh, but the, the, the First Amendment really does have a limit here on how much it's going to help. Uh, legislatively, there is more help. We do have statutes uh, and other um, types of protections and laws that give the press access, that give the press protection, that aren't afraid of just trying, at least trying, albeit in a flawed way, you know, there's no perfect way to do it, but trying to tell us who is doing, you know, the important work uh, of the press and then giving them the protections and the rights that they really need uh, to do their job that, are, and, and those needs are different than what we see with all these other people who are just putting things up uh, on, on, on blogs. But um, so for, for now, I think that's where we have to focus our attention is on legislative protections, uh, where, where we can find them and get them. Okay, so speaking of legislation, let's turn now to discuss fake news. And fake news has a problem in that it has a little bit of instability in what counts as fake news. It's been variously used to apply to true disinformation, fa false news presented as true, biased news, news with which one disagrees, or news that's not really newsworthy, uh, what, what uh, Ronell has referred to as fake newsworthiness. And so <laughs> what, if anything, going back to the question of what's newsworthy, should the law do about fake news, if it should do anything? Well, since you're starting with me, I think uh, 
One of the things I've been particularly interested in is something called the Communications Decency Act, Section 230. Uh, and this is a law that suggests that websites are not liable for information published on them by others, so by outsiders. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why we have this proliferation of websites uh, that exist with no other purpose but to perhaps spread false information uh, or to uh, inflict emotional harm. Uh, this is a federal statute that protects those websites from liability for information published by others. For the longest time, we've embraced this, and certainly I think we've embraced it um, if we, um, if we uh, represent media and we're pro-press because we don't want the New York Times, for example, being liable for information published on its website by a commenter. But it has enabled fake news sites to exist. It has enabled uh, websites that um, cause uh, emotional distress to others to exist. And when we think about protections of media, I wonder how many times people who suggest that media has too much protection actually brings in under the umbrella of media those sorts of websites along with uh, reality television, along with uh, mainstream media. So my sense is that um, the CDA perhaps might be tweaked to be a little bit more protective uh, of mainstream media uh, and also individuals. So one thing you said that I thought was very interesting is the perception of what is media, which I think circles back to the very first question about the Pew study. Um, I think a lot of people have an opinion of media that is informed by whatever media they happen to be thinking about at the moment. And if you say, what do you think of the media? And someone's thinking CNN, my local television station, my local newspaper, Infowars, Breitbart, they may have an opinion based on what they think media is. But you know, I do think it's important to be more granular about how people perceive different types of media. Um, I do agree with you. I think Section 230 has had an enormous impact on the development of the internet. And in fact, sites like Facebook and others wouldn't be able to exist without Section 230, which kind of is the First Amendment of the digital world. Um, so I, I do think it's very important. I think it's um, important to remember, though, that it's only meant to protect the platform or the website that actually publishes information from a third party. It doesn't protect the third party. And we're now seeing people sort of saying, well, yes, I'm not going to sue the platform, but I can find out who published this. And if it is someone creating this ridiculous conspiracy about my neighborhood pizza joint that you know, somehow housed this pedophile ring in the basement, which, and doesn't even have a basement, um, you know, maybe, there, maybe there's a lawsuit there before the armed gunman charges into my neighborhood and tries to shoot up um, a place on the basis of some fake news that was created solely out of speculation. So, you know, I think I'm, I've never been a big fan of suing for libel. I've always been on the defense side. Um, <laughs> but in cases where people are simply making up the news and masquerading as news outlets, I think maybe it's, it's time to be more aggressive. And perhaps even websites that exist then to, in fact, disseminate that sort of information with knowledge that the people who leave posts will, in fact, be uh, defaming or, or otherwise. But, but the problem is that repealing or limiting Section 230 is not at, in any way going to solve this fake news problem. I because totally. the, you know, even if you took it away and you said, OK, the platforms could be sued, what can they be sued for? Well, they have to have a cause of action. So it could be defamation. It could be intentional affliction of emotional distress. It could be invasion of privacy. There are, in some cases, there would be exposure. But the phenomena we're talking about is, uh, is a situation where a lot of the fake news is, is doesn't, doesn't fall in that. There is no defamation plaintiff. There is no invasion of privacy. There is no intentional affliction of emotional distress. It's just false information. And at the time, right now, there, the First Amendment protects fake, you know, false speech, you know, unless there's some other element to it. You know, it's a, fraud or there are certain types of false speech that are not protected under the First Amendment. So if you were asking earlier about the law. You know, some people might advocate, well, we should um, not protect false speech. I personally would have a really hard time with the government deciding truth and falsity just in the, you know, when it's not tied to defamation. Um, so, so anyway, I just I appreciate what Amy's saying. It could help 
in certain instances, but much more narrow than the, the problem I think our nation is facing. And right just now. another sign, sort of going to what uh, Kurt was just saying, that you know we're living in the upside down, that up, you know white is black, and uh, is that uh, going to the other uh, interpretation of what fake news means, which is just you know fake news that um, you know lobbying it about when you really just mean that you don't like it, but it also has this interpretation that it is actually uh, inaccurate. There was an instance with a newspaper in Colorado where uh, a, a politician called that newspaper fake news, and they at least talked positively about considering suing them for defamation, saying you've defamed the reputation of my newspaper uh, you know, to our, our, our financial harm uh, by saying that we publish inaccurate uh, things, whether what definition of fake news uh, that he meant. But I published, I have practiced media law for, for a little bit, not nearly as much as, as our other uh, panelists, but newspapers aren't defamation plaintiffs, right? That's just not what you do. <laughs> it's kind of just a rule. So the idea that it was even toyed about publicly for a little bit really, I think, said something. I well, yeah. that case also illustrates something I've talked about a lot, is it's relatively easy to sue for defamation, uh, which is why you, there's, you've seen a, a great number of defamation suits recently, like the Stormy Daniels case, but it really is hard to win a defamation case. Oh, yes. So so sometimes people sue to make a public pronouncement that, that you know, they're aggrieved. Right, and so if you repeal Section 230, you're inviting a lot of lawsuits that may be frivolous. And so I'm concerned about chilling speech uh, because I'm worried people will be concerned not just about whether they can ultimately win, which they might be able to in some of these lawsuits, but there are real costs that come just from defending, uh, you know, and doing your motion to dismiss, or very unlikely you can even get out on a motion to dismiss, and you have to go through discovery. It's very expensive, even if in the end you would win. Which, which makes the case for anti-slap laws, which are laws that shift the fees um, to, the, uh, to the losing plaintiff in a defamation case, if we can establish that the case was brought on a matter of public concern and it was to chill um, the person's speech. It takes away a bit of the, the sting of the expensive legal fees, and they are expensive. But to go back to um, you know, something that Mary Rose was talking about, which is uh, having, not wanting a court to make a decision between what's fake news, what's, what's real news, and what's not real news. I'd also be leery at having a court decide who is a journalist. And these are, these are very nuanced and difficult issues. Kurt and I spent hours and hours with, with senators and congresspeople and their staff trying to thread that needle. During, and then, committing an act of journalism. Committing an act of journalism. You know, you know, we've and, got a nice nine-page definition now. Which <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is clear, clear as mud. And, and, and this was back in 2005 to 2009 when some of the, the now established internet players in journalism, which, which most of us would agree, all of us would agree, are legitimate journalists, were, were still emerging and, and the bona fides hadn't been established. There was just a case in, in Florida recently, it arose out of the Trump administration, it's the dossier case, where BuzzFeed published the dossier um, about um, uh, President Trump and, and the Russian uh, involvement in all of that. And um, a, a, a Slavic oligarch named Gubarev has, has sued um, BuzzFeed in Florida and um, his claim is progressing through the Florida courts and a judge had to sit back and decide, is BuzzFeed really journalism? Is it a journalist? And I think it's really beyond question, you know, with, with what BuzzFeed has done in establishing its journalistic bona fides that it is a journalist. But I'm uncomfortable seeing the court system being the ultimate decider of that. We fought a revolution, um, you know, a couple of hundred years ago to get away from the government licensing journalists and making those one, decisions. Of, one of the difficulties, though, there's a, there's a case out there that you all may know about more than I do, uh, where a court had to decide, in fact, did decide, uh, that a, uh, a teenager who was posting things on the internet uh, from his parents' basement was, in fact, a journalist. Uh, and, so, uh, and so if we, my concern is, how do we define newsworthiness uh, in a way that protects privacy uh, if we're going to embrace everyone as a journalist. Doesn't that then end uh, any sort of protection at all, including shield laws for, um, for BuzzFeed and others who are um, more mainstream, accepted journalists? You have to let me just uh, chime in yeah. on this question of um, the use of the term uh, fake hmm. news. I really feel quite strongly that um, we would be better off as a society and perhaps in terms of our educational role of the way that uh, Mary Rose was describing, one really powerful thing that we could do is to bifurcate um, that term, right? It has plainly been conscripted. Um, 
uh, to mean something different than either of the words mean independently, right? If you look up the word news and you look up the word fake, uh, we're talking about fabricated information that appears to be on a matter of public concern, and um, it has now been um, used at least as often and perhaps more often uh, as a sort of clapback against uh, coverage that a particular political party or a particular um, uh, covered individual dislikes, right? It's the, uh, the constant retort in um, Trump's tweets about press coverage of him. Um, and I think that we would do well to bifurcate the principles, to actually describe what our beef is with what's happening here. Because we do, in fact, have a major constitutional crisis that centers around one kind of fake news, which is there are bots in Russia that are creating information that is not accurate and flooding our, um, our media airwaves with um, right, Facebook and Twitter and elsewhere uh, with information that is patently false and that is designed to manipulate its readers in ways that are harmful, right? Fabricated information is side one, which is itself a constitutional crisis. But I think there is an equal, very different constitutional crisis happening about the other kind of fake news, which is that leading up until very recently, all of the historical investigations that I have done about press president tensions in the past have suggested that whatever else existed, there was this constitutional expectation of executive counter speech. That is, if the press of any variety engaged in news gathering and publication on a matter, and the, press, uh, the president took issue with it, the executive branch thought there was something problematic about it, it was not true, or even it was not newsworthy, or it was biased, or it was problematic in a wide variety of ways, there was an expectation that the president would use his platform. He, if, if there's anyone in the world who is better situated to sort of have a podium at which he, uh, he clarifies information that we've been delivered that is in some way wrong or is in some way biased. It is the, the presidency of the United States. But what we instead see is this new trend of the president not offering us counter information, not contributing additional information to the marketplace of ideas, but rather just pushing back against coverage and labeling it fake news. That's really harmful to a democracy to have no executive counter speech to not have any I, what I would like to know as a citizen is you know uh, okay you've you've labeled that piece of information fake news is it because you have you have you yourself possess information about some factual error within it by all means tell me what is that factual error is it because um, you as president think that, uh, that the um, the bent of that particular media outlet is such that they're not delivering it in a fair or nonpartisan way by all means I explain to me why that is true but um, a simple sort of um, uh, invocation of the term is really problematic because it actually leaves us as citizens less informed rather than more informed. And I think that notion of executive counter speech has really waned in ways that are really, really problematic uh, to, to sort of the um, holding together of the polity. I'm gonna ask my two practicing lawyers, we, we're running out of time, but I'm gonna ask my two practicing lawyers uh, kind of a last question, since the Trump administration began, how has your practice in defending journalists and journalism changed, if it has? What, are you seeing different kinds of cases than you saw before, and, and in what way? What do those look like? I'll start with the positive. There's been a, a reinvestment in um, FOIA, Freedom of Information uh, litigation. We've got eight or 10 uh, FOIA cases that have come in since President Trump was elected. Um, and, and just to clarify, I mean, that's where you're asking the government to produce documents and information that it has control of. There are federal statutes and state statutes mandating access to certain kinds of government information. And because it's optional money to be spent on lawyers, newsrooms don't have to do that. When you get sued, you have to hire a lawyer. Um, it, it really was a luxury. Um, and now I think the newsrooms have, have realized that it's an absolute necessity. And so we've seen a lot of that growth. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it's, it's a way to uh, battle back against the you know, fake news claim by actually going and obtaining documents, obtaining access to meetings that were otherwise closed to you. So there's a lot more effort in getting access to information, also because that information is disappearing from the public record now. And there's an effort being made to preserve it and find it. Um, 
and I think investigative journalism is, is clearly on the upswing, yeah. uh, you know, because because of the need to really show what's what's going on. So I, I do think it's been a reinvigoration in many ways of the efforts of the press. And are you, are you all representing new types of? I ask you about new types of cases or a switch in the balance of cases, but are you representing new types of clients? Well, as I mean, I think our clientele kind of reflects what you've mentioned about you know how journalism is changing. I mean, BuzzFeed, for example, didn't exist a few years ago. Now it's you know a significant player. I mean, there are all sorts of digital um, outlets that now you know are either publishing journalism or acting as platforms for journalism that um, are truly important. And so I, I'd say we our practice has changed a lot.